Why do different reactions take place at different rates? Why does reaction rate depend on temperature? And what is the mathematical form of that dependence? And most importantly, for the purposes of this video, what is the molecular basis of chemical kinetics? What's the molecular picture we have in our minds when we think about reaction speed? That's the subject of this video. The model that really informs our thinking is known as collision theory. We'll start by going through the foundations of collision theory, some basic foundational principles, a lot of which make a lot of common sense if we really think things through. And toward the end of the video, we'll advance toward advanced collision theory, which gets us a little bit more mathematical precision to our model at the cost of additional complexity. Let's start, though, with the basic tenets of the collision theory of chemical kinetics. The basic idea here, and the idea underlying everything, is molecules must collide with sufficient energy and in the proper orientation in order to react. There are no chemical reactions at a distance, right? The molecules have to be close to one another, and that approach to getting close takes time, and orientation also comes into play. So first and foremost, the rate of reaction is proportional to the number of collisions per unit time. That has to be true. The more collisions that are happening in a given amount of time, the faster we would expect the reaction to go. Tenant two here is that the reactant species have to collide in a proper orientation. Any old bumping into of two molecules won't do, especially if a very specific part of the molecules reacts. For example, if one very specific bond is formed in the midst of a chemical reaction, the reactants have to collide so that the atoms that bond are in close proximity. If they don't, we wouldn't expect a reaction to occur. Tenant three is that collision has to occur with adequate energy. To permit the mutual penetration of electron clouds, we'll develop that picture in more detail here in a second, and the reorganization of bonds. Any old collision won't do. The molecules need to have sufficient kinetic or potential energy, or a mixture of both, in order to react. And this is because, generally speaking, because electrons have negative charge, electron clouds associated with molecules repel one another. So for them to get close, they need to have a certain amount of energy. We also need to supply the reactants with the energy to break any bonds that need to break in the course of the reaction. And so there's a bit of a barrier associated with that in many cases, especially if, if bonds are breaking. This is the basic tenet of collision theory, that there's an energy minimum or barrier that we need to get over in order for a chemical reaction to take place. And it's a quantity known as activation energy that we'll see in more detail here shortly. Take, for example, the reaction of two CO molecules with an O2 molecule in the gas phase to form CO2. There's a definite orientational requirement to this reaction, since the new bond that forms is between carbon in a CO molecule and oxygen in an O2 molecule. And so if the molecules collide oxygen on oxygen, which you see at the top of this figure, no reaction is going to take place. That's an improper orientation. Only collisions where the carbon collides with an oxygen are going to lead to the formation of CO2. And this is kind of the first half, that, that tenant two, the proper orientation is required. The second half, this energy barrier that the reactants must surmount, is summed up at the bottom of the slide. The reactants must collide with an energy greater than what's called the activation energy, which we'll denote E sub A, in order to react. And the structure that we get when the two reactants are close to each other and the energy is at a maximum, the energy of the molecules is right at the point of surmounting that barrier, like at the top of a roller coaster about to head down the massive hill is known as the transition state. And transition states are characterized by partial bonds and partial charges. In more advanced courses where you start learning more about the molecular level details of reaction mechanisms, you'll learn to interpret and even draw transition states for elementary steps yourself. This metaphor of an elementary step of a chemical reaction looking like a roller coaster really blossoms with the concept of the reaction coordinate or energy profile diagram, which you see on this slide. What reaction coordinate diagrams do is relate the progress of a reaction to energy, or show how energy changes as two reactant molecules come together and undergo some kind of chemical change. 
So as the slide says in the caption, we've got the dependence of energy on a coordinate related to reaction progress, where reaction progress is basically on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have energy. And here you can see the activation energy directly on the reaction profile diagram. The activation energy is this barrier we have to surmount, starting at the reactants, A plus B, and going over an energy hill. At the top of that hill, the structure we have right here is known as the transition state. And once we're over that hill, the reaction pretty much goes spontaneously to C plus D, the products. To measure the extent or progress of the reaction, we typically try to choose a, a relatively simple, simple if we can make it simple, measure of the reaction progress. Something like a bond length, if a bond is breaking or forming, or a bond angle, if there's a change in bond angle as a result of a reaction. You'll see many reaction coordinate diagrams like this over the progress of your chemistry education. And the two key things to note now are the activation energy, which we've already highlighted, and the overall change in enthalpy or free energy of the reaction, which is modeled by the difference in energy between the reactants, we see A and B here on the left-hand side, and the products C and D on the right-hand side. Both of those exist in energy valleys, they're stable species, and the difference in energy between those is the enthalpy or sometimes free energy, depending on the diagram, change associated with the reaction. If we back up briefly now to the tenets of collision theory, Tenet 1 tells us that the rate of reaction is proportional to the number of collisions per unit time. And this intuitively should be related to temperature, since the higher the temperature, the faster the average speed of the molecules, the greater the average kinetic energy, and presumably the more frequently molecules are colliding with one another. So the rate constant and the rate of reaction should depend on temperature. An equation and model known as the Arrhenius equation expresses that dependence of the rate constant on temperature in equation form. And three different versions of the Arrhenius equation are shown on this slide. The basic functional form says that K is exponentially dependent on one over the temperature. And so K is equal to A, we'll talk about what that A constant means here in a second, times E to the negative E sub A divided by RT power. R times T is an energy. So the exponent term here, E sub A divided by RT, is a dimensionless number, negative E sub A divided by RT, I should say. And if you, for example, play around with graphing this function, E to the negative 1 over X, you'll see that as X increases, the rate constant likewise increases. So this does express an increasing dependence of the rate constant as temperature goes up. If we take the natural log of both sides of this equation, we arrive at a form that we could say is linearized in that we can recognize two functions that are linearly related in the resulting equation. Specifically, the natural log of k acts like a y variable, and 1 over the temperature, or the temperature to the negative first power, acts like an x variable. The slope is related to the activation energy. It's negative e sub a divided by r where R is the ideal gas constant. Actually, the Arrhenius model is profoundly dependent on the ideal gas model. It treats the reactant like an ideal gas, which is why R appears. And so we can, for example, extract a measured activation energy from the slope of a line when we plot natural log of K against 1 over T. And the y-intercept is the natural log of A. And again, we'll get to A here in a second when we get to the bottom of the slide by subtracting two versions of the linearized form from each other at two different points, one and two, we get the multi-point form, which we've seen before. And here, thanks to the properties of logarithms, we can say that the natural log of k2 divided by k1 is equal to negative e sub a divided by r t2 to the negative first power minus t1 to the negative first power. So this allows us, for example, to infer the value of k at point two and temperature two if we know the value of K at point one and the temperature at point one. Now, what about this A value? Well, to understand what A is, the first thing I encourage you to notice is that if E to the negative E sub A divided by RT, if that exponential factor were equal to one, the rate constant would be equal to A. This means that this value A, the frequency factor, is the maximum possible rate constant, the rate constant at infinite temperature, since letting t go to infinity would make that exponential term go to zero, and e to the zero power is one. 
Intuitively, this is the likelihood of productive collision. How important is the orientation factor? The more orientations that lead to reaction, generally speaking, the greater the frequency factor is. And it's related to a quantity known as the collision cross-section. You can think about it like the cross-section of the molecule upon which collision would lead to productive reaction. The bigger that is, the bigger the value of A. And because this is a rate constant at infinite temperature, these values tend to be very, very large for reactions. The beauty of the Arrhenius equation is that we can use it in conjunction with measurements of the rate constant as a function of temperature to infer the values of the activation energy and frequency factor. And this problem gives us a taste of how this process works. In this problem, we measured the rate constant as a function of temperature for the decomposition of HI to H2 and I2. And the results of those measurements are given in the table that you see here. What we want to know is what's the activation energy for the reaction. Well, we've got K as a function of T, and that suggests that the Arrhenius equation is going to be relevant. But in order to actually measure the activation energy, we need a graph, specifically a graph, of the natural log of K as a function of 1 over T, which fits the linearized form of the Arrhenius equation that we just saw on the previous slide, right? So when we make that graph, and I'm just going to show it stylistically here, we know that the slope of the resulting line is going to be related to the activation energy. Specifically, the slope is the, the activation energy, rather, is negative one times the slope times the ideal gas constant. And if you plot this data, and you can take my word for it, but I encourage you to plug the data into Excel, do some calculations, and plot it yourself, we arrive at the slope is equal to negative 2.2 times 10 to the fourth Kelvin. And the units are, in fact, temperature. And this is also worth verifying on your own. When we take that slope, multiply by negative 1, so we lose the negative sign, and multiply by r, we're going to get the activation energy. And before doing that, I do want to point out that the best, quote, version of r to use here is the version with units of energy, um, something like 8.314 joules per kelvin per mole. This ensures that the activation energy will come out in units of joules or kilojoules per mole. It's not that you can't use liter atmospheres. Liter atmosphere is actually a unit of energy, but this is most typically how we think about activation energies in units of either joules or calories. So anyway, we do the math and we get that the activation energy is 180 kilojoules per mole for this reaction. And this was all based on graphical application of the Arrhenius equation and Arrhenius model to extract the activation energy from the slope of the line that appears when we plot the natural log of k as a function of 1 over t. 